Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Ryan, Ryan Sweet, Director of Real-Time Economics, and Chris Dorides. Chris is the Deputy Chief Economist. Hey, guys. How's, hey, Mark. how's it going? Good? Good. Okay, Chris, uh, I've noticed Ryan is, is relentless. He's trolling me on, on Twitter, uh, and he's, he, he's getting annoyed at me because I'm not responding, but uh, Ryan, in my defense... Someone's got to work. I'm like, I'm <laughs> traveling. <laughs> I can't keep up with. And where do you get these cartoons? I mean, they're not cartoons. They're memes. Mark, my meme game is pretty strong. So you got to, you got to, oh, I know. Got to step it's it up. Like, it's awesome. I mean, I don't know what to do with it. I mean, like I got, I got to sit, you, you troll, it trolls the right word, right? I say we said trash yeah. talk last week, but it's probably trolling. Yeah. What's the difference between trash talking and trolling anyway? Does anyone know? I don't know. Are they the Isn't same trolling thing? behind the scenes like you're, Oh, maybe you're you're yeah. surreptitious. You're like a Russian hacker trolling. That's a bot or something. A bot, <laughs> maybe. It's not like so. When we trash talk, we're right in your face, right? It's, uh, yeah, I see. <laughs> I see. That 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 that's, makes sense. That's how me. I would define it. Right. So you're not so, checking the timestamps because I send these things at eleven o'clock midnight. So I know I'm still working. So oh, that's a good point. Yeah, that is a good point. That is you're asleep. Point. I'm I'm oh, up yeah. doing work. Yeah. That's, that's but really Ryan cool. is the meme master, right? So for anyone in the audience who's looking for a meme, Ryan's your guy. So. Mm-hmm. That's true. So, oh, so you're not, you're not trolling me. You're trash talking me. So trash talk is the right word because you're like in my face. There's yeah, no, okay, yeah. there's no I mean, ambiguity honest, to, who's saying all this stuff. To be honest, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. I know, but I, I and I will re-engage, you know, like when I have a, a minute to, to re- That is fine. I, okay. Take your time. Do I respond to my wife? To the client or to Ryan's uh, trash talking, what which which one would you do? You got to get your priorities in. Uh, in yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. That's, uh, Sorry, I, I, next Thursday. It's going to be a Thursday I night. Think about it. You know, he's so clever. I got to think about it. You know, like, I, I, like, I can't just come back reminder. with anything because if I do, I'm, I'm you know, you're just setting yourself up for more. I know. <laughs> I guess the most important question is: Do you know what that movie was from? Or that meme? Uh, from, oh, the one know. about. So, uh, deafening silence or what was that now the one where they're both related the one okay. where there's three guys sitting in a car that's dressed like a dog and then there was one where i talked about inflation being transitory and then oh yeah no i don't know where, what movie uh, was that we yeah need an intervention you know, chris no? no are you I, serious i don't know what yeah. you're talking about no. dumb and yeah. dumber I have to go to oh, Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. Oh, one of the greatest movies. It, it is, but you know, unfortunately, I've never watched that movie from start to finish ever. I've only seen clips here and there. You know, my favorite is that of him. It was that uh, Will Ferrell, right? Will Ferrell. Did you ever That's see Jim, Jim Carrey? Jim, Jim Carrey's Dumb and Dumber. Oh, is it Jim Carrey? Mm-hmm. Is Dumb and Dumber? Oh, it's not Will Ferrell. Oh, no. Okay. I'm way off. <laughs> <laughs> Will Ferrell, though. I like Will Ferrell. Uh, Jim yeah, he's Carrey, good. Okay. That one scene where his, I think it's his daughter who plays the landlord. Have you ever seen this? Yeah, yeah. That's really I think funny. that is just hilarious. That's yeah. Funny. Anyway, back to business. Uh, consumer price index, CPI, inflation, kind of top of mind here for about a year. Um, maybe some good news, I think, sort of, maybe. What do you think, Ryan? What, what, do, you, what do you make of the CPI report? Yeah, well, I thought it was a mixed bag because the headline uh, CPI, consumer price index, Growth in that moderated month over month and even year over year came down. I mean, it's, we're still north of 8% on a year ago basis, but we're kind of heading in the right direction. I think the one surprise was core prices, which strips out food and energy, which are pretty volatile components. And economists, we look at this because this is a good, pretty good predictor of where future inflation is headed. That actually accelerated month over month, but that has energy written all over it. And even though uh, core CPI excludes energy, there's you know the pass through to other parts of that basket. So look at airfares. You know, higher jet fuel prices led to a double-digit increase in uh, airfare prices. Transportation, other transportation service prices went up. Uh, so I think, you know, I think we're moving in the right direction. It's just I think it's going to happen a little bit slower. But all in all, I think you know, if you look at the CPI and then you look at the producer price index, which came out yesterday, was which you know was encouraging. Those two feed into the Fed's preferred measure of core inflation, which is the PCE deflator. And the core PCE deflator is going to be up three tenths of a percent month over month compared to the core CPI, which was up six tenths. So, you know, you know, less than half or roughly half. So, uh, you know, all in all, when you dig through all the the CPI, I mean, 
I know Chris, he can chime in on the shelter component. There's starting to be a little whiff of that, you know, that's, that's picking up. Uh, so we need a lot of goods disinflation to offset the services of inflation that's uh, coming in. I think over the next few months, you're going to see the, the CPI report show more evidence uh, of that. Okay, so there was a lot of cross currents in what you just said. So just a level set, CPI, consumer price inflation, overall peaked on a year-over-year -year basis in March at 8.6%, came in April down a bit to 8.3%. Correct. I, I, did core CPI also decelerate on a year-over-year -year basis? I, yeah. Mm -hmm. It did. Uh, but you're, but uh, and so you're saying, okay, broadly speaking, we're moving in the right direction. May, maybe not uh, as good as it looks because core CPI, excluding food and energy, accelerated a bit in, in the month. And so we're not kind of that before, until we see that happens, we can't feel like we're kind of definitively moving in the right direction. Yeah. Until we see the core CPI settle in month over month into that 2.2%, 3%, 0.3% increase month on a month to month basis sustained, then, you know, we're, yeah, we got to get down there first. Right. Okay. And I, I, sorry, I'm just closing out my, uh, you know, my, uh, my outlook here just to, cause it's going to be ringing the whole time showing you how busy I am and why I can't respond to mm -hmm. random memes. But uh, anyway, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, uh, there was, uh, now this is really getting into DNA very quickly, but I think it's important there was a large increase in uh, new vehicle prices, CPI mm -hmm. prices. And that runs counter to the, we saw a decline in used vehicle prices. And we've been, you know, obviously we're looking at vehicle prices because that's kind of the poster child for sectors that have been disrupted by global supply chain issues. And if we start to see vehicle prices kind of roll over, that might make us feel a little bit better about prices for other products that have been disrupted by uh, the supply chains to start coming down too. So can you explain what's going on there? You know, what, what's the reality of what's going on there? So used car prices have fallen for three consecutive months now, which I think gets to your point that they're starting to roll over. Uh, maybe not as fast or as you know, large of a you know, rollover that we would want, but uh, new car prices, you know, that, that stood out, uh, but there was a methodology change by the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they switched from you know, surveying dealerships on what prices were to uh, using transaction data. So, you know, they, they published the uh, new series versus the old series ahead of the report. And we could see that, you know, the new uh, uh, methodology was running hotter than showing larger increases than the old methodology. Uh, and that's one reason why our forecast for the CPI was above the consensus. All right. And just to give people a sense of it, how important this is, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you go back to March when inflation peaked, it was 8.6%. I think in that month, two percent, almost two percentage points of that was vehicle prices, I believe. Is that correct? Yep, a little bit more. A little bit more than that. So this is a big deal, you know, really. It is. Directly big deal, but also what it signifies for the rest of what's going on in supply chains and what it means for prices. Mm -hmm. So every month, what I do is I update our uh, supply chain constrained CPI, which includes uh, basically what we did was we went through all the bowels of the report and identified what uh, uh, components are being affected by global supply chains. And tops on that list is vehicle prices, uh, but you can add in bedding, you can, uh, furniture, children's uh, apparel. Uh, and when you add it all up in April, it added less than two percentage points to the CPI. Whereas the last several months, you know, January, February, March, it was adding well north of two percentage points to year over year growth in the CPI. So the, that is a little glimmer of hope that we're, you know, if that's sustained, we should see further improvement in the inflation picture. And I guess the other big thing here was, again, oil prices, energy prices more broadly. And that actually picked up a little bit in the month. It fell in, do I have this right? No, no. Did it, did it come in in April? I can't remember. Yeah, it came in in April. It came in in April. Mm -hmm. But it may, it may, oh, actually it may be a source of increased inflation in May because we saw a little bit of a bounce and. Oil Correct. prices. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the other okay. area to watch is food prices. Sorry, Chris. Uh, just food prices because rising commodity prices for wheat, corn, I mean, across the, you know, pretty much across the board, you know, food prices have been increasing quite rapidly over the last, you know, several months. And that's likely going to continue. Oh, isn't that mostly energy too, though? Diesel prices getting mm -hmm. yeah. things from yeah. the farm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So all, a lot of it just goes back to oil. So as soon as 
hopefully oil starts heading south or prices start heading south, we should start to see some real relief here on the inflation front. Okay. Chris, I know you want, you're biting at the bit. So what did you want? No, to no, say? just, uh, yeah, no. You, were, you were talking about energy. Uh, electricity prices were up quite a bit as well, right? So that's also hitting uh, consumers, right? It's not just oil prices, gas prices directly. Yeah, right. Uh, and Ryan alluded to this, but maybe you want to flesh it out, Chris, about uh, the cost of housing. So rent growth has been very strong and that's now bleeding through in, fu in full force into the measures that are in the, in the consumer price index. Yeah, there's a little bit of acceleration in rents, rent growth as well. And we've talked about this in, in previous uh, sessions that uh, uh, rent is a bit uh, lagging in terms of how uh, new rent increases, rents, on, well, increases on new rentals takes time to feed into the, uh, the CPI calculations, but they are doing so now. And I think 4.8% uh, year over year for rent and owner's equivalent rent. Um, so that's significant. There was a large increase actually in hotel and motel uh, prices, but that's a relatively small component of the overall CPI. But nonetheless, I think it was like 20, 22% year over year, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Okay. So, you know, if you look at our forecast <clears throat> for CPI inflation, it's, we peaked at 8.5%, excuse me, 8.6% year over year in March. It, we're going to be closer to five, five and a half percent by December. And we're going to be uh, close to two and a half percent by the end of 2023, December of 2023, which is pretty close to, if not on top of the Fed's target, which is two to two and a half percent, depending on which, which inflation measure you're using on the CPI, it could be about two and a half percent. Does that feel right to you, uh, uh, Chris? Does that still feel uh, roughly consistent with the way you think things are going to play out here? Yeah, I, th I think so. I'm still... Okay. Maybe it's optimistic, but or I guess it's realistic in the sense that I think the Fed will slam on the brakes if mm -hmm. if needed. So we'll get there, but whether we get there gracefully or or not, that's the open question. Yeah, great point. One way or the other, we're getting there. Either everything kind of sticks to script, the pandemic fades, supply chains iron out, oil prices recede as the worst of the fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine start to get behind us. You know, we and we get. Get, get back to those those uh, more typical kind of inflation numbers we feel comfortable with on our own, or if that doesn't happen, recession. Then recession. If it says uh, enough of this, I'm I mean, literally just I'm going to push you. I'm going to push this economy into recession to get inflation down. Yeah. Okay. I'm a little worried about the lockdowns in China over yeah. the next few months. That feeding into inflation. So I I agree with you and Chris that you know the contours of the forecast are correct. We might just. You know, it might just be delayed a little bit because of what goes on in China. Yeah, and that goes to the COVID lockdowns, right, Re related to Omicron. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's just going on forever now. I mean, and I guess, I guess that's the risk because we know Omicron. You just how do you get how do you stop Omicron? I mean, it's like I don't know if these lockdowns, you know, ultimately work. I mean, it feels like you're going to be doing this forever. You know, trying mm -hmm. to keep things at bay. It's practically a, a non-vaccinated. Our unvaccinated population as well, right? So it's because they were all using the kind of the poor quality Chinese vaccine. In, in Correct. China. Yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah, it's highly susceptible to, right. to the spread. Hey, let me ask you, Ryan, on that front, uh, I know we put a stress index, a supply chain stress index, to try to capture these things that are going on in the supply chains, including what's going on in China. Has that started to tick up higher? I mean, that mm -hmm. I know it was the stress level of stress was very, very high last fall when Delta hit. I think it peaked in the index, and it's an index of freight rates and reports coming out of uh, purchasing managers, what's going on in the labor market in terms of unfilled position, transportation distribution, a bunch of things. That mm -hmm. peaked in last September, started to come in uh, late, late last year into this. I haven't looked at what's happened in the last month or two or three. So oh, the last few months it's stabilized. And okay. when we get the new data point, we're just missing one or two inputs that we get next week. Uh, it's going to tick back up. Uh, and I think that's really tied to what's going on in China with the yeah. lockdowns. Right. Something that doesn't feed into the index, but what I watch is the number of ships that are basically parked uh, uh, offshore on China. And it looks like an enormous you know, parking lot. It's just that there's so many bottlenecks right now. Oh boy. Okay. All right. Hopefully, uh, companies, U.S. companies have kind of 
figure out different ways to source what they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's the risk. That's their point. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Let me on that uh, one other question. I mean, obviously going back to vehicle prices in, in the context of the disruptions to, to ch the Chinese production, uh, are we noticed, have you noticed is global vehicle production still, and it's off bottom. Is it, is it improving or is it stalled out? Do you have, do you have any sense of that? What's going on with global vehicle production? I've, I've, I've seen uh, Mexico, U.S., and Germany. And, you know, overall, both of them are, are rising, but not that quickly. So yeah. I don't know what overall global production is, but for those three, it seems like they're starting to move in the right direction. Well, that's a big chunk of it. You're missing, yeah, that's you're what missing I thought, Japan, yeah. I, but that's a big chunk Correct. of it. Okay. All right. I guess we should watch that very carefully. Okay. Okay. Uh, anything else on the CPI, consumer price report? Anything else on the inflation front? No? Okay. Any other uh, statistics that came out? And I, I don't want to take away from the game, but uh, uh, if I am, then just stop me and we'll go right to the game. But is there any other major statistics that came out that you want to call out before we move on? No? Okay. Chris, I, I noticed the University of Michigan survey. Did you notice that? That came out, I mm -hmm. think, today. It yep. kind of fell to a new low. Yeah, well, well what's crushing that is gasoline prices okay. and the stock market. Because the University of Michigan survey is very sensitive to uh, personal finances. Just this is all based on the questions that they ask. It's related to, you know, more are related to finances. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm not overly worried. I mean, I know historically when sentiment falls by a lot in a very short period of time, that's that's a concern. That's kind of a recession indicator. But if it's low and stable, it's not great, obviously. But I don't think it's signaling anything going off the rails here. Would that be consistent with your interpretation, Ryan? Yeah, I got, now I got to get a new number. Oh, oh, damn. Sorry. I would have gotten right. that right then if we played the game. Uh, all right, then I'll give it to you. I'll, I'll come up with a new number for the game, but 40.9, okay. negative. Oh, in negative 40.9? Oh, this is your differential between income and um, no? That's Michigan. Oh, University of Michigan survey. Negative no, 40. Mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a combination of different measures in the survey right nope just straight up straight up it comes right out of the survey oh no no you gotta construct you gotta calculate it but... oh that's what i mean you gotta oh, okay. you gotta yeah, calculate yeah, yeah. it this is something yep. minus something is it yep. a decline from peak or something yep very good chris yeah oh so from its post-pandemic peak not its pre-pandemic peak but post-pandemic peak ah. the university of michigan survey is down 40 points <clears throat> which is a lot it's about half almost, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, it's a pretty sizable drop. Right. Okay. Okay. I'll give you one while we're on the topic. 76 is this, is this part of the game? Yeah, are we doing the game? Well, or? Not, not really, because we're okay, talking the University this, of Michigan. This is an appetizer. Go it's ahead. the University right. of Michigan, so you're, okay. we're already in the ballpark here. Yeah. But I looked at the report as well, 76.1 and 41.2. I, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot buried into the into that survey. There is, that is, yeah, probably not fair. Uh, like how uh, deep are you going? Are we going like buying plans? No, no, is top it, level, it, but uh, is it regional? A demographic it, it, uh, income split. group. It's by income group. No, by uh, a Democrat versus Republican. Exactly. Uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> Republican. Oh, so, uh, for those of you listening on the uh, podcast, I think you really should hug a Republican if you if you know one, because forty one point two is the lowest. <laughs> Lowest level of consumer sentiment in the history of the of the data. So they're really feeling it. Hold it. Wait a second. Say that again. Republican sentiment. Yeah. Forty one point two is the lowest in the history of the uh, of the series. That is amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the lowest in history. Yes. Yes. Going back to the sixties. Uh, whenever the uh, whenever. Yeah, whenever it started. Oh, I would, I'd love to know the answer to that. How far back that? That is incredible. Isn't it wild? Yeah. That is wild. Oh Let's my gosh. That. Okay. Oh, back to 1980 was the 19, first. Well, still that comes. Still, of, it's Ronald Reagan. Back to Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah, okay, we're now, talking Great Recession. You're talking. <laughs> yeah, you're talking Great Recession. What was it in the Great Recession? Oh my gosh. Do you have that in front of you? Uh, let me. Uh... Well, while you're doing that, let me explain the game because we're going to go dive in the game. Oh, by the way, I should have said up top, the topic 
at hand here is monetary policy. So we're going to play the game and then we're going to dive into uh, the Fed, you know, you know what, the, what the Fed has done, what the Fed is going to do, what the Fed should do. Ryan's got a lot of opinions around this. So, you know, we're going to dive deep. Um, 48.2. What was it? 48.2. That is just yeah, so they're blowing. <laughs> You know but when you the know high? What? what get this? Huh. When do you think the Republicans had the highest consumer sentiment? Uh, when uh, we invaded uh, Afghanistan with uh, during uh, Bush, uh, you know, early '90s. No, no, because confidence was really high, and you would have thought Republican sentiment would have been really, really high. That's not it, though. I should say there's a, um, you know, there's some gaps in there, so I don't have the full '90s or. Oh, so, oh, okay. So really, it, it, it's consistently reported since uh, 2006. But. When President Trump was elected? Uh, no, there it also uh, you know Got did high. accelerate there. Yeah. Um, when? <laughs> February 2020. <laughs> You're kidding! The month before it's, the pandemic. The month before the pandemic. This is weird. Oh, I don't know what's going on there, but it hit 127.2. Oh, well, confidence was high then. I mean, so the economy was yeah. booming. The stock market was rising. Yes. Was the stock market rising at that point? I mean, it, yeah. Well, before, yeah. right before cases right? in Seattle started yeah, right. showing up yet. Yeah. Right. Wow. Interesting. Okay, anyway. so gas prices were low. Oil prices were relatively low. Boy, that is, that is uh, really a. The new... tax cut had been in place, right? So. Okay. Do you have the Democrats up now, too? You want Maybe. Democrats right now? Well, yeah, well I, I want to know when their low point was. And when their high point was, do you have that? Off oh, let me. Uh... Yeah, you find that. I'm going to explain the game. The game, okay. the statistics game uh, is pretty straightforward. We each put forward a statistic. Uh, the, the rest of us try to figure what that out, what that statistic is uh, by questioning and um, uh, guessing and uh, clue giving. Uh, the, uh, the statistic can't be so easy, which shouldn't be uh, so easy that we get it right away, can't be too hard so that we can't get it at all. And the, and the best statistic is one that's relevant to the topic at hand, which is any statistic that came out recently or anything that's kind of top of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, did, you get, did you get it, Chris, before we dive in? The low was October 2008. Okay, that makes it's, sense. That makes that's sense, financial right? financial crisis, yeah. And, and I'm looking that's for when, the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and everyone else, uh, the financial system went belly up. And, and the it, high seems yeah. to be April of 2021. April, really? Yeah, it, and it really st stuck out, right? Well, it's, you know, that's <laughs> the vaccines were rolling out. People were feeling pretty good. They thought the pandemic was over, right? And that, you know, uh, the Biden administration at that point, you know, was getting a lot of credit. For credit, us, uh, yeah vaccine rollout so you know maybe that was what, what was going on interesting anyway that's fascinating. anyway yeah it's fascinating <laughs> fast that's fascinating fascinating okay uh who wants to go first uh, ryan chris who wants to go well i gotta get a new number let chris go first okay chris you go okay uh i'll give you a number that came out this week and i'm gonna tie it to another number that came out last week okay oh Three, we're, we're, we're elevating the game now i know 3.2 percent that's the number i want you to guess and, that came uh, out this week. Came out this week, three point two percent and nine point nine percent. And it's linked back to something that came out last week. Yes. Is it inflation related? Yes. All right. Price related. Yes. Does it come out of the consumer price index report? It does. <laughs> uh, Is it year over year? Well, the, the first one does. The other yeah. one was yeah, last week. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Is it year it, over it's, year it's or price month related? Month? But it it's not the CPI. It is year over year. 3.2% year over year. Yes. And it's, it's, gonna, one, it's a good or service. It's a good or it's good. It is a service. It's a service. Um, Are you going to tie it back to something last week? Yep. Yeah, that's interesting. It, it's not airfares, is it? Oh, no, airfares are a lot more than that. Year over yeah, year? They're up like a lot 20, more than that? 22% or something. Year I'm trying year. to think that most things are up close to double digits. Yeah. Are you going healthcare? Medical oh, care service? Uh, no, not not healthcare, but you're getting close. Very close. Oh, can you can you and that's something very near and dear to Ryan's heart, I think. Yeah. Oh. It's got to be recreational activities, gotta be like tickets to a ball game or nope. something. Nope. Nope. Veterinary services? 
Oh, oh, so you're, you're, you're circling the drain there. But. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, so it's medical. Uh, yes, because you're not medical, wife. not medical. Yeah, my wife's a veterinarian. Veterinarian, yeah. right. Uh, and it's near and dear to Ryan's heart. I think it, uh, it affects him. Dog food? No. <laughs> no, it's got to be more than that. <laughs> more than that. Uh, can you give us any other hints? It affects his family life. Uh, oh, are you, wait, are you going with, uh, wait, does the CPI have baby formula? Oh, no, but that would be a good one. Well, that, have you seen any shortages <laughs> about baby formula? But isn't it's, it's, that's isn't prices gone up a lot more for baby formula? Well, I would assume, yeah. 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 I'm out. I'm out. I might throw up the white flag. Uh, white flag. It, it's in. Is it when you look at the CPI? They've got different, you know, categories. Big, uh, top line categories. Is it in medical it's, services? I, you know? uh, I, I believe it's actually in educational services. Oh, okay. Oh, day, daycare. Daycare. Child care. Uh, daycare prices. Daycare. Oh. Okay. Oh, that's less than I would have thought. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's what so three point two percent. Can you guess what the nine point nine percent refers to? Is that the peak to date decline in employment for daycare workers? No, that's uh, that's eleven percent. You're but you're on the right track. Nine point nine percent is the increase in the average hourly earnings Ooh. of daycare ah, workers. Ah, that's a good right. One. So prices up three point two, but the the input costs, you know, the price they're paying, the the wage they're paying to childcare workers is up nine point nine. It's interesting. Not uh, not sustainable, right? That is interesting. Although I had a hard time believing it mm -hmm. that it's only three point two percent because I, I thought there was you know uh, a, a, a real shortage of daycare centers available for for parents. Huh. Yeah, so employment's down eleven percent. Yeah, right. From the so, pre-pandemic, right? So huh. we're still short. I wonder if there's some kind of measurement issue there. You mm -hmm. know, what, what they're measuring I, exactly. I think the contracts are sticky, right? So. Oh. Okay. So I don't think the the price of daycare can adjust that quickly. I see. Um, it only goes up like once a year. Well, you right. think the season? Well, maybe it's a seasonal. Oh, maybe seasonal adjustment it issues. Could, there could be the something there too. Yeah, that could be too. Yeah, it could be something we've, like that. We've had this uh, debate before, uh, Mark. If you remember when we were looking at physician prices, we yeah. had really strong wage growth among physicians, but uh, the CPI for physicians was really really weak. So we were puzzled. Uh, one thing to look at is the response rate because the response rate or the share of people are responding to the BLS with the price, uh, the inflation data has just steadily declined. And it's really, really, it's almost to the point where you, you just can't believe it. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Okay. Well, that, that was a good one, Chris, though. Yeah, that was a good one. Good. Yeah, a little counterintuitive. I mean, if you had said 12.2%, that would have been... <laughs> More intuitive. That's why I chose it. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I wanted to prove once and for all that there's there is no collusion, right? Uh, no, no. Okay, that was good. that was or, good. Or, or there was, and this is a way to do a bit of a head fake, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you gotta, or Mark was just too busy to check his email. I was just too sure. busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I didn't have time. I didn't have time to check my email. I got too many emails. Yeah, good point. All right, Ryan, you go. You're up. All right. Did you come up with one? Another one? Yeah, I got one. Okay, very good. Minus fifty percent. <laughs> All these negative numbers, you're coming up with big negative numbers, negative mm -hmm. 50%. Okay. I don't think it's in the CPI report, is it? No, it's not. It's not, it's not inflation related. Is it's it uh, cryptocurrency related? It is not. It's not. <laughs> is it an asset price? It is not. No. No, no asset. It's price. an economic data. Oh, it is an economic. Is it a release that came out this week? It did. Oh. Is it in the small business survey? It is. Mm -hmm. Is it? Warmer. Oh, I know what it is. It is the uh, diffusion index for uh, expectations about how the economy is going to do six Ex months from now. Yep, excellent. Very oh, good. That's oh, a cowbell. Look at this. That's a cowbell. Now yep. you guys are now. Chris is thinking I'm colluding with you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I know. <laughs> ah, that's a the good tangled one. web we weave. So you know no, why I know that, that statistic? A... Yeah, you know, you know why I know that statistic? Why? So because I was uh, as part of my travels. I was at a, con a, a meeting of economists. Uh, con it's called the Conference Board. No, what is it called? Conference of Business Economists. And these are uh, economists that uh, are in the business community. They're like chief economists of different businesses. Like Jonathan Smoke. Remember we had Jonathan on mm -hmm. from Cox Automotive? He's in this group yep. uh, and they people present. Well, uh, one of the uh, folks on this, and I hope I'm not giving you, I'm 
saying something I shouldn't be saying. I, I don't think so. But anyway, one of the people in this group is Bill Dunkelberg, or Dunk for short. Can you believe this? Bill started that survey 50 years ago. 50 mm -hmm. years ago. Get out of here. Now, wow. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. And so he was talking about these these numbers because they you know had just come out. And uh, if you take a look at some of the survey results for some of these questions, it's like a floor is dropped out mm -hmm. of the survey, which is spooky, a little spooky, right? I mean, because I do think a recession is kind of a loss of faith. You kind of lose faith and you can see that in these sentiment measures, they, car they start caving. Now we haven't seen it in the consumer sentiment indices, Except for Michigan, low, except for the stable. Republicans, right? Yeah. Oh, except for the oh, and, oh, oh cool. and there's a oh, point. And the small business yeah. survey is very Republican. Dominant. I was about to mention that. Yeah, you want to tie them ah, together? Yeah, there you go. We've Circle of life. Yeah, Actually, we... this would be a good tweet, Brian. I think I'm going to tweet this out. This is really yeah. Cool. I send it to you. Uh, yeah. In the past, like you know, uh, we looked at you know how well does the NFIB survey do in predicting economic activity. Uh, and it overstates economic activity when there's a Republican president, and it grossly underestimates it when there's a Democratic uh, yeah. president. So I think there's some political bias, which it makes yeah. sense. I mean, small businesses, yeah. you know, Republicans tendency are more pro-business. So, you know, it's well, not- I have to tell you, uh, I'd say at least a quarter of the emails I'm getting are from people that, you know, pretty upset about everything. <laughs> And they're Republican, I mean, generally. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, very, very upset. Interesting. That is interesting. Okay. Uh, but you were surprised I got that one, Ryan. You thought you had me. Yeah, I was a little, I was, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with that. Okay, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, I've got, I've got one. It's All a right. little different. It's a little different. Okay. I'm trying to mix things up a little bit too, right? So just to spice things up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to give you part of it already. It's in the CPI report. And it, and it goes to the inflation numbers for cities, metropolitan areas. So the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, Ooh. put this together. They put together CPI numbers for about 20, 25 different cities across the country. Okay. Tell me, if, uh, and of course, right now, year over year nationwide, it's 8.3%. Give me, there are four cities who have inflation year over year that's in double digits. If you can give me, any of those cities, uh, I consider that to be. I got to remember which ones successful. BLS does. Yeah, is it similar to the ones they do yep. for the e the employment cost index? Uh, yeah, pretty similar. Yeah, they're, they're, right. you know, they're, they're big cities. They're not. Yeah, yeah, you know, they're not small areas. These are big areas. <clears throat> yeah. uh, and then also, I'm going to ask you which cities have had the lowest CPI. Yeah. So take. You want to guess? You know, think about it logically. Uh, think about yeah. it logically, okay? Think about it like, where would you expect inflation to be higher regionally? You know, because areas out of the country that are really rip roaring strong, a lot of migration inflows due to remote work, you would expect house prices going skyward, right? How about Atlanta? Atlanta? Uh, oh, I should check. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also assuming that sure. I they, think they, it is they drive Atlanta. a lot. It is Atlanta. It is Atlanta. In the yes, South. Absolutely. Yeah, are. Atlanta. All right, Chris. I would turn. guess Austin, but I don't know if that it's no. Covered. That's that's too small. That's not too small, right? Yeah. Uh, how about a Phoenix? Is Phoenix. That... Phoenix is yeah. uh, one of the four. Seattle. Uh, Seattle, mm. no, okay. no, because that's actually lost people, right? See, see, I think oh, yeah, I right. so. I mean, Boise, which is the poster child for you know surging housing markets and remote works workers coming in. A lot of them are coming from. Um, uh, from uh, uh, from uh, Seattle. Okay. Miami. No, not Miami. Ah. Not, Miami's pretty good though. It's pretty it's right up there. It's uh, just below 10%. Well, that, that, that's not good. <laughs> what do you mean that's not good? You don't want high inflation. You don't want 10% inflation. Oh, oh, oh. No, <laughs> but it's, it's in, you know what? It's indicative of, I think, largely the housing market because when you, yeah. you know, the biggest component of the CPI is housing, like a third of the CPI is housing. Right. And, you know, if you got rip roaring housing markets and therefore rapid rent growth, that's going to show up as high inflation in that market. So markets where you got rip roaring housing markets generally have high rates of inflation and vice versa. How about Chicago? No, no, that's the, that's the lowest in the country. Chicago really? is 
yeah, dead in the water. They're losing people like mad. They're, you know, it's a lot of net outflow, remote work. Yeah, I love I mean, Chicago. Why would... Actually, it's not the weakest. The weakest is San Francisco. That's the weakest. Hmm. And again, same deal. A lot of people yeah. live in San Francisco for, you know, Boise. out in the West. Yeah. Boise. <laughs> is it Boise? Boise? Boise. Boise. We were corrected on this. I know. I forget. I remember. Anyway. Okay, you got two more to go, unless you give up. L.A. No, L.A. is weak. Remember, L.A. is uh, losing people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are there any in the Northeast? People. North, anything in the Northeast? I would, I would be it's surprised. All, if there's, uh, all South. South. Guys, Dallas. I can tell you. you gotta Dallas. Yeah, Dallas. Am I speaking into the ether here? Come on. No. What areas <laughs> that are gaining people? <laughs> uh, you know, not losing people. Actually, they all, the ALS also <laughs> calculates CPIs for broad regions, right? So you can mm -hmm. look at census regions and then by size of city in the census regions. And the weakest census region in terms of CPI inflation, and it's not so weak, it's 7%, is New England. So that's the weakest. That's, and Mid-Atlantic, where we live in Pennsylvania, is you know pretty darn close. All right, I'm, I'm about ready to give up on you guys. Dallas. Well, Dallas. Yeah, Chris said Dallas. No, no. Houston. No. <laughs> No. We're just going to name every metro area in <laughs> Galveston. Okay. All right. Stop, stop, stop. I'm going to put you out of your misery. Orlando. Tampa. 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 Okay. Yeah, Tampa. It's like everything know. goes back to Tampa. Yeah, right. And here's the other one it makes logical sense Riverside, California, because Riverside is the county that's east of LA. So all those folks from LA actually the beneficiary. The migration, yeah. and we know this from the Equifax credit file data. So we track people's address changes month to month. And the biggest movement of people county to county, you know what, you know what that is? LA to, to uh, Riverside. That is the largest, in sheer numbers of people, that's the largest number of, of outflows uh, in the country that from, from LA to, to Riverside. So uh, Riverside's been booming. And San Francisco is really weak. Chicago is really weak. New York is really weak. Uh, DC is weak. Uh, when I say weak, when I say weak, it's not really weak. I mean, it's, Seven eight percent. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. But anyway, I don't know. Uh, what would you think? Did you think that was a pretty good statistic, or was yeah, I? That was a good one. That was a good one, yeah. right? Yeah. Kind of yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people out there want us to talk about regions, and I did. I thought that was pretty graceful the way I did that. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Uh, okay. Anything else on the game before we move? Five on? stars. Leave a comment. Uh, yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Let's talk about monetary policy. A lot to talk about there. Let me begin the conversation this way. Do you think, obviously, we got big economic problems. You know, now it's inflation. Inflation is raging. And the Fed has gone to uh, on the high alert, raised, laid out a path for much higher interest rates going forward to try to quell slow growth so we don't, the economy doesn't blow past full employment and uh, exacerbate the wage and price pressures uh, and try to get those inflation, uh, uh, get inflation back down. How much of what we're observing today on the inflation front is the Fed's fault? Do you, do you think the Fed is any culpability in these high inflation numbers? Uh, Ryan, what do you think? I'll let Chris go first. Okay. Yeah. What, was it you're going to do the thumper principle? If you can't say anything nice, you're not going to- Yeah, I'm going to start. I'm, I'm trying to use the thumper principle. By the way, that, you sent me, did you send me the clip? Oh, no. One, one of our clients sent, it, sent me the clip. It was uh, the movie clip. And I got it. Mm -hmm. I think I got it exactly right. On the mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Chris, what do you think? Do they deserve any? Do they deserve any uh, blame for this um, mess we're in? So it's a good question. I, I think there's a fair amount of um, Monday morning uh, quarterbacking going on, right? In retrospect, sure, we can look back and say, "Oh, well, clearly they should have been raising rates or uh, engaging in quantitative tightening earlier on to fight off the inflation." But if you think back and you put yourself <laughs> in those months, when we had Delta, Omicron, and or even further back, if you're thinking about the vaccines and, and what was going on there and all the projections of a very extended period of time, you know, I think they, they did the best they could. And I, actually, I think we are uh, paying the price of our success in uh, avoiding a depression with the inflation. So could they have done uh, certain things better? Yes. Uh, I never understood the MBS purchases going on for so yeah. long with the housing market so hot. So that I would fault them. Oh, okay. Uh, MBS mortgage-backed securities. Yeah. They, they were, that's part of their quantitative easing, their bond buying. They bought treasuries. They bought mortgage-backed securities. 
that brought down mortgage rates. And you're saying, why are you buying those securities and bring down mortgage rates when the housing market is, you know, it's on fire, right? On fire, on fire. Right. So, okay. Yeah. I can, we can critique and say there are things they could have done better, certainly. And maybe they could have started the, uh, the tightening process a bit earlier, but what, what are we talking about? Three months, yeah. maximum six months. I don't know that you would have started a year ago, uh, given the evidence that you had. So I don't know. I still give them a, you know, if you want a letter grade, a B plus, uh, yeah. at least. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. What, what about you, uh, Ryan? What do you think? I know you're a top grader. You're 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 a prof, I believe. You're, yeah, yeah. Yes. I got to yeah. do grades this weekend. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Their yeah. final. Yeah, they have to complete their final tonight. Do you want to do you want to scare your students right now and say anything about how 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 it looks? Yeah, the average grade is going to be less than Chris's grade on <laughs> for the Fed. <laughs> They're quaking now, baby. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, they all did really well. They, Are they all did well. Uh, okay. it, was, it was a good group. All right. Uh, yeah, everyone's above that, average. <laughs> they get a little bit of the blame, but if I had a rank order, you know, why we have the inflation we have today, I yeah. would say pandemic, yep. yeah, fiscal policy, energy, Fed. So, I mean, they're they're low lowest on the uh, the list of reasons for inflation. And, and what the Fed because they're just too slow to pivot and start raising rates, or what? what? No, I think they did quantitative easing for too long. Uh, you know, they could have started dialing that back sooner. Maybe get a little but bit that, of tightening. Frankly, it's on the margin, right? Yeah, yeah. All this is, yeah. yeah. I don't. That's why yeah. the Fed's the <laughs> lowest on the the totem pole. So, okay. I think the number one reason we have inflation is the pandemic, followed by fiscal policy, and then the energy price price shock. Really, fiscal policy. Oh. Yeah, that it was too much money all at once. Uh, that it, it, yeah. why do we have supply chain issues? Because yeah. the supply chains were stressed, and then the U.S. consumer boat bought a boatload of things. Yeah. That just you, amplified it. You haven't been listening to me on this podcast carefully enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm all listening. right. Well, I, okay. I, I, I'm with you on the pandemic, right? Because that's yep. then that goes to supply chains and scrambled labor markets. You wouldn't put the Russian right now, and with the inflation we're experiencing right now, you wouldn't put higher oil prices and Russian invasion higher than fiscal policy. Oh no! I'm ranking so it since, straight up since on energy prices. That's adding two two and a half percentage points to inflation. Yeah, I'm doing it overall going, since no, but right now, year, right? inflation right now. All right, if on. you want, we can flip flop fiscal policy and energy. Okay, right? now I, mean, I feel a lot better. Okay, All okay, right. I'm with you on that. Okay. All right. All right. So we have pandemic. Mm -hmm. We have the Russian invasion and the surge in oil prices. You Correct. say fiscal policy. I I I don't think that's yeah. Think it's a definitely there in all of this. I'd say the Fed doesn't really deserve any blame here. For this. I'm, I'm with you. I mean, the only thing that is a, a little cautionary, and maybe we'll learn something from this, is when they changed policy and said, look, we want, they actually, they, they, they added to their, their objectives. Like in, from the beginning of time, since tw they were put on the planet, I believe in 1913, their objective was, you know, low stable inflation and ultimately they were added to that was full employment and then they said okay the next thing they added was we have to be more inclusive in terms of the growth that we receive and obviously that is a very laudable objective you know to, you, that's great we need to do that but can monetary policy actually accomplish that in a way that doesn't result in broader problems and I, there i i'm not so sure and i think that might have contributed to the decision to wait longer to begin to react, you know, end QE earlier and begin to start talking to the marketplace and saying, hey, start preparing for rate increases and get long-term interest rates up a little bit faster than they, than they had and take some of the juice out of the housing market economy. So I, I don't, I don't want to stretch that too far, but I just throw that out there as maybe something they should have, they should be, you know, thinking about more carefully. It felt like they kind of slipped that in on the fly, felt good when they said it, and everyone's mm -hmm. kind of shaking their head, yeah, that's what we should do, but really can the Fed actually accomplish all of those objectives in a reasonably reasonable way? And I'm not so sure. I worry. Not with their primary tool, the Fed funds rate. I yeah, that's, that's- Blunt instrument. Yeah. Yeah, so I, they got yeah. one tool, really, right. maybe two now they can buy. Well, I view QE just as an extension of normal monetary policy i'm just buying. yeah it's the new normal now yeah so I, you're there you got one tool and now you've got three objectives that becomes goals that becomes pretty tough 
well actually well, they've for, got other tools too right there's regulation they can yeah okay i'm, I'm all for that can, yeah i'm all for that you know that because that goes to things like you know, cra and uh, inclusive credit extending credit in the banking system that kind of stuff but in terms of monetary the conduct of monetary policy which is what we're talking about yeah you know, context of inflation do you think though that that was a consideration this cycle? I, I, it was in I, all their speeches. It was, it was, yeah. it was like a talk. I don't point. think that was the primary. I think it was really oh, no, not primary. the pandemic. No, not it was primary. all about the pandemic for this. Well, here's the other thing that in, I'm, I'm, I wonder. So they changed their framework and said, look, we're not targeting 2% inflation at any point in time. We're targeting 2%, and this is the core consumer expenditure deflator, which is a lower rate of inflation than the CPI, but we're targeting core C PCE at 2%, not at a point in time, but through the business cycle. So that means if I'm suffering through low inflation below two for an extended period, which was happening for a decade after the financial crisis, I need to be above two for an extended period. Do you, I don't think that's a mistake. I actually think that's good policy. But, I agree. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, I think they just got dealt, you know, Bad luck. I mean, inflation was yeah. peaking and then the Delta variant hit and then supply chains just went AWOL and right. inflation accelerated. Yeah. And they could not predict, no. you know, oh. Delta coming along and knocking out global supply chains and, and stopping vehicle production and causing vehicle prices to go north. Can't, how, how, you thought everyone thought with the vaccines, this thing was over or close to, certainly didn't envisage these supply chain issues. And then no way that you can uh, uh, have in your thinking Russian invasion of Ukraine, right? That just was, you can't do that. It can't be part of your thinking. And so those two things, those two, two massive supply shocks came along very surprising and they've had to adjust. So I, I don't, I just have a very difficult time blaming, putting any real blame on them for- I mean, What do you think of my MBS argument? Uh, no, I'm with you on that. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think a key channel, and we're going to get to this in a second, but a key channel through which monetary policy affects economic activities through asset prices, right? You lower interest rates, you, that, that causes stock prices to rise, that causes housing values to rise. So they're using that as a real tool lever to get the economy growing more quickly and ensure that we don't go into recession. And it also is very beneficial because it helps with refinancing activity, right? Because you got rates so low, down to 3%, below 3% at one point. I think I got down to 265 and I'm 36. Yeah. You, everyone's in the money. Everyone can refi and they can you know, lock in these low interest rates, which by the way, does call into question the efficacy of higher interest rates going forward. But anyway, we'll come back to that. But uh, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you know, they went overboard on the MBS. It does complicate things now because I think the MBS they purchased is... MBS, nobody wants to buy. It, right. You know, it, it makes sense when you're in a crisis, you buy the stuff nobody wants to buy. That's stuff that has higher prepayment rates, right? That, you know, and you don't, if you're an investor, you don't want a high prepayment rate. So selling that's going to be more difficult. And so it makes it more difficult for them to get out of this, you know, in terms of quantitative tightening. So yeah, I, maybe you're right on that one. I, I give you, I give you, uh, I have to think about that some more, but it, I think it's reasonable. Argument. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I think we've, we've come to the conclusion that, the Fed may be on the list of culprits here, but way at the bottom of the list and debatable whether they should be on the list at all. Okay. All right. Let's turn to uh, looking forward. What is the uh, appropriate monetary policy? And, and, and to get a sense of that, what does the market now expect the Fed to do? And I, and I think this is important because I don't think I've ever, I've been following the Fed for a long time, 30 years. I don't think I've ever remembered a, a time when the Fed has been so explicit about what it wants to do with interest rates going forward. It's like, it feels like it's crystal clear. So what is embedded in market expectations is probably a very good representation of the reality of where the Fed wants to take the economy at this point. So, so let me, Ryan, turn back to you. What's, what are the markets saying? What are, what are futures markets saying about future monetary policy? Yeah. So based on Fed funds futures, they have, uh, two more aggressive rate hikes by the Federal Reserve. So 50 basis points in June, another 50 basis points in July. And then they're followed by uh, more modest 25 basis points increments at each of the following meetings for the rest of the year. So futures expect the Fed funds rates to be close to the Fed's estimate of the neutral Fed funds rate, uh, where interest rates are neither stimulatory or contractionary for, for the economy by the end of the year, which is around 
two, two and a half percent. But then they expect the Fed to have to do even more heavy lifting and go even higher. So they have the Fed funds rate peaking at 3.1% this tightening cycle. Then the Fed you know, pauses for an extended period of time and then starts cutting rates uh, in early 2024 or early, uh, late 2023. So you know, the markets think they're going to, to Chris's points earlier, slam on the brakes and then try to you know, navigate a soft landing by easing uh, down the road. Oh, I didn't realize that. So if you look at, uh, in futures markets out into the distance, into 20, you said 2024 is when they markets mm-hmm. expect the Fed to start cutting rates. Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Um, okay. So uh, our forecast isn't quite as aggressive. We have the funds rate. We have, a, we have a half point increase in June. We have a half point increase in July. We have the funds rate at the equilibrium, our star of about two and a half percent by the end of the year. And just to make that clear, our star equilibrium is kind of what people think, what the Fed thinks, what we think is consistent with an economy that is at full employment, growing at potential with inflation at target. Of course, we have none of that. Uh, So we're saying we're going to go above that. But in our forecast, we have the peak of rates, the the so-called terminal rate at 2.75%. So just a quarter point above the equilibrium rate. And then it comes in a little bit in 24, 25, comes back down to the equilibrium rate, which is about two and a half percent. So, you know, we're about, I think we're about 50 basis points. The terminal rate in our forecast is about 50, at least a quarter point, 50 basis points, half a point below the market expectations. Did I have that right? Roughly right? Yeah, exactly right. Okay. Okay. What do you think of that forecast? Uh, Do you think, well, that's it. What do you think of that forecast? That's our forecast, by the way. That's our baseline outlook for the Federal Reserve, which is different what the market thinks, different what the Fed wants the market to think. So we're a little bit out of consensus here, right? Yeah, what but that's where we, we should be. Because I, okay, okay. I mean, the market's doing some of the Fed's work for them. Yeah. You know, financial market conditions have tightened quite substantially recently. That reduces the need for you know some rate hikes down the road. So I think being below where the consensus expects expect it to be is where we should be. And I think that's what the Fed's going to do. You think ultimately that the, the economy is going to slow, inflation is going to soften, mm-hmm. inflation expectations are going to normalize to the to a sufficient degree that 2.75 terminal rate is good enough. We don't need to go higher than that. No, I don't think they need to go any higher than that. But you do think that that, would, that path is going to result in recession. Yeah, I mean, one reason why I don't think we might risk the forecast, I would say, yeah. are actually weighted towards fewer rate hikes. Because I think the Fed's going to break something before we get to 2.75%. So, yeah. uh, I mean, if, just look what's going on now. I mean, financial market conditions are going to tighten further. Uh, you know, the Fed put, you know, the Powell put, you know, which is this idea that, you know, stocks can only fall so, lo- so much before the Fed rides in on their white horse and saves the day. <laughs> Uh, is a lot lower than what, you know, I think people are anticipating. I mean, Powell wants financial market conditions to continue to tighten. So I think that's, he's getting what he wants. Uh, and we'll just see if the economy can, can weather it. Yeah. Okay. So just because I uh, assumed a lot, there's folks out there that don't know that you, we've had discussions in the past on this podcast about recession risks. And you have said in previous episodes last week, maybe certainly when Nuriel Rabini was on, you were feasting on his darkness. Uh, you were all in. You put the you put the recession odds at what? At sixty five percent, I think. Over, over the next, uh, I think five. it was seventy five. Uh, it was seventy five percent. Okay. Yeah. You're, right, you're so down. before you start, you know, jumping off the thumper principle, uh, <laughs> did you see that? Facts. You see, I think was it Chris's LinkedIn poll asked who like, do you agree with my recession odds seventy five percent? Chris's, which is. 50%, which is right down the middle of the fairway. Like, yeah. And then your 35%? Mine was uh, 35. 40. 35. Was it, well, thir- no, is it 30? No, over the next couple of years. Oh. I think, yeah. All right. I think 30, 40 over 18 right, fair months. Enough. I'm at the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But so the majority of the, of the people are with me. Oh, that, that means you're doomed. Yeah. You're doomed. The consensus is always wrong. By, by, <laughs> uh, by a sample. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how many people responded, by the way? I, uh, uh, that's not important. Okay. That is not important. <laughs> All right. How many times did you six respond? people that responded. How many times did you respond to this survey? 
Uh, once I did. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Because I was afraid I was going to be the lowest one. I was like, oh, I got to, I got to bump this rude. up. Here. But at least you're honest. That, that's a very oh, honest yeah. thing to say. I, I don't know. I'm not sure I would have fessed up to that, but okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Chris, what do you think? That You see our forecast. It, it's 2.75 terminal rate, 2.75 terminal rate. The market, uh, just to be sure, Ryan, yeah. is, it, is the mar- terminal rate for the market 3.25, 3.25 or 3.5? 3.25? 3.1. Oh, it's only 3.1. Okay, yeah. we're not even that far off. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. I thought it was higher than that. Okay. Chris, what do you think of our forecast? Yeah, I think that's right. It's reasonable to me. I think actually the hiking will be front loaded, mm-hmm. right? So I think we'll get 50 in, in uh, June, July. Yeah. And then, you know, easing off, but yeah, the contours in terms of going to 250, 275 by this time next year, I think that makes sense. Okay. So you, you guys, what you guys are saying, I believe, is that uh, financial conditions, and I'm going to define that in a second, but financial conditions are consistent, already consistent with a, an economy that's going to slow and inflation is going to moderate. We don't need to see stock prices fall anymore. We don't need to see mortgage interest rates rise anymore. We don't need to see corporate spreads widen. We don't need to see the value of the dollar increase. By, by the way, those are all different measures of financial conditions. And it, this is important because one of the key ways that monetary policy interest rate changes impact the real economy is through first through its impact on financial conditions, on financial markets, on on lending financial institutions. So stock prices, mortgage yields, corporate interest rate, cor- you know, interest rates on corporate bonds, uh, value of the dollar, lending standards, all those kinds of things. So you're saying you feel like where these markets are now, where the stock market is now, where the dollar is now, that's consistent with um, uh, you know, where monetary policy should be. We don't need to see more corrections in these markets. Is that right? Do I have yeah. that roughly right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, abstracting from some volatility, right? There could, yeah, you could certainly see yeah. markets yeah. go up and down a bit here, but yeah, we're pretty I mean, much one where thing we that we should probably, do. one thing we should probably debate, and you know, not necessarily on the podcast, but for the next forecast is, you know, I think there's a reasonable scenario where the Fed gets rates up to their estimate of the neutral Fed funds rate, which is currently two point four percent, and then they pause, you know, whether it's six months, nine months, just to kind of reassess. I and mean, they've done that in the past. Like kind of, right. you know, let's make sure we didn't break anything before right. we go even higher. Right, right. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. That kind of makes sense. So so they, they 50 basis points next month, 50 basis point, half a point the following month, get it up to the two and a half. I'm using two and a half because it's just rounding and that's where yeah. it was before last, yeah. last meeting. Although, by the way, that might come down lower because we have two new board members coming on, I believe. That's right. right. Correct. And if they, if they uh, join with like what the consensus is among the Fed governors for yeah. what the neutral Fed funds rate is, it could drop to 2.1. Oh, really? That low? Mm-hmm. Okay, very interesting. Okay, I want to come back to that in a second, but you're saying that, um, what were you saying about that? I just, I don't know. Just, oh, they, they, they would pause. Oh, they, they would get, pause. They would pause, right. Yeah, that, which makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, so I mentioned a, a number of measures of financial conditions, equity prices, mortgage yields, corporate bond yields, value of the dollar, lending standards. Am I missing anything? Or is that an exhaustive list? Or is there anything else that would go into? I know there's different financial condition indices that are created. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the standard fare, right? Cryptocurrency. Yeah. A cryptocurrency, right? Yeah, well, that's, that. yeah, that's broken too, right? That came down quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. I mean, included that. It's a good sign, right? (laughs) Yeah, real interest rates. Yeah, so let's talk. So there's other other measures that are important in trying to understand if monetary policy, how it's going to affect the real economy and growth. And one other way people look at it, well, we mentioned financial conditions. The other is real interest, real short-term interest rates. So take the, the short-term interest rate the Fed pegs the funds rate at and then subtract. I suppose you should subtract inflation expectations, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, to get to the real yield. Right now, if we get to the terminal rate of two and a half, inflation expectations, certainly kind of one year, five year forwards or five year, five year break evens is higher than that, right? Mm-hmm. So it's yep. you know closer to two and a half to three, depending on the measure. So that means real yields, even when we're at the 
equilibrium rate, the R star will be negative, right? Two and a half less inflation expectations, you're in negative territory. That would that doesn't feel like that's enough, right? To slow the economy's growth rate. How do you how do you think oh, about that? I think we're arguing that expectations are going to come in, right? Okay. So oh, so you think the expectations are going to come in below two and a half, come back down into that two two and a half percent range. So we get a, a positive real yield. Still very low though in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me ask you one other question about this while we're on the topic. Why is 2.4%, 2.5%, 2.1%, you know, what makes that so magical? I mean, how do how do how are people getting at that number? I mean, I've got I've oh. got my way of getting to it, and I don't really want to go into it because it's like a pretty long explanation. But do you have a sense of that? I mean, why do people think that's the equilibrium yield interest rate? Any sense of it? Chris? That's Ryan? where the IS curve uh, crosses potentially. Okay, there you go. That, okay, that explains it. You got to draw it out now. Yeah, okay. I, I get it in theory, but why empirically is that where it's landing? Why do people think that's where it's landing? Is there anything rooted in, in, the, in our empirical world that says that's the right number? I mean, why did we settle on that? Well, there's some econometric models, right? The, well, I can't remember. Uh, Ryan will know. LW, HLW. Yeah, Leibach Williams. <laughs> yeah, but they yeah, were in that. They don't even publish that anymore. Right now. But they still do. Do they? I thought they stopped. Yeah. I thought they got broken and they weren't publishing anymore. I thought they, I yeah, I thought they stopped during the pandemic. Yeah. But if you go before the pandemic. Right? Yeah, but it wasn't and a half, and a half was, was right. a lot lower than two and a half, right? Yeah. A lot lower than two and a half. I thought it was two and a half. Okay. I thought it was. All right. Okay, that's the best explanation we can come up with. This is this kind of number that everyone says, okay, it's two and a half, but we, no one really knows why it's two and a half. It's kind you of want like me to explain, you, inflation explain you why I think it's two and a half? It, well, it's kind it's of similar a, with inflation. Why does the Fed aim for 2% inflation? Well, that, I mean, that, that's, I think that's because at 2%, no major part of the economy is going to be suffering deflation. Because once you start suffering deflation, mm -hmm. that's pretty hard to manage through. And you're, you're, you're going to hurt that industry, that part of the economy. But if you, yeah, so but you keep it at two, then no, you know, people, some parts of the economy will have less inflation than that, but it's not deflation. You know, it's still positive inflation. Right? And Why I, not and three, I don't know if 2% right. is the right number. It could be higher. Yeah. It should be higher. I think it should be higher than that. But, I yeah. agree. but, that, but that's the logic, I think, the logic behind. But what's the logic behind two and a half? Okay. Well, I mean, definitionally, is that that's the rate that they think the Fed funds rate should be with no, the no, economy no, no. at I, yeah, full I, employment yeah, and stable well, prices. Well, okay. Well, how did I? How did you get there empirically? How did you get to two and a half percent? You want me to explain how the summary of economic projections is? A... No, no. You know, you you're you're playing coy with me. You're playing no, coy. No, I. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Here, let me. It's kind of like Nehru, get, like full yeah, employment. This is how I. We have two and a half percent in our in our in our in our forecast, mm -hmm. right? So you're saying, well, Mark, why why is it two and a half? What what is the two and a half? Okay, it, I have an anchor for the ten year Treasury yield. In the long run, the ten year Treasury yield should equal the economy's nominal potential growth rate. I think that's in, theoretically and empirically is hold, held true. And nominal potential growth is four percent. When the economy is at full employment and growing at its potential, inflation's at two. It's two percent real growth. That's two percent inflation. Four percent ten-year treasury yield. Then I say, in the long run, through the business cycles, the spread between the ten-year and the Fed funds rate is 150 basis points. And you can go calculate. So I take four. I minus one and a half. I get to two and a half percent. That's how I get to two and a half percent. That, but I, I don't know a, a, another way of getting there. Uh, in, in why other people think it's two and a half percent, because I, I don't I think very very many people have kind of that framework in their minds when they're thinking mm -hmm. about interest rates. Does that make sense though? What the way I described it? Would you buy into that? It does, but isn't it tautological? Right. So the Fed mean? set their Fed funds rate previously <laughs> at this magical number, and now you're saying, oh, well, the spread to the magical number is 150. So, well. Yeah, that's what, yeah. The, 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 what's magical? What what what's the stake in the ground? What is economically determined is that long term interest rate, and you right. do need some difference between because there's, you know, lots of reasons why there's a difference between short and long rates, and that 
you know, uh, inflation expectations, volatility of inflation, volatility of real, real economic growth. And when you look at it historically, that is roughly, it's 150 basis points of 1.5 percentage points, you know, over through the business cycle. And, and that's how you get to two and a half percent. Anyway, I, I know yeah. I'd belabor this because it bothers, it bothers me to no end that we kind of just take this as given, but I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why. Well, it's like all these theoretical concepts. Well, what is the full employment, right? What's right. Nehru? What's uh, but potential they're, GDP? They're rooted in some empirical, ba- there's some empirical basis to it, right? I mean, well, they're, they're rooted in some theory, primarily. Yeah. And then we try to come up with some okay. empirical basis, but it's our history is limited, right? So, so you're saying I shouldn't be so annoyed that no one can explain to me why it's 2.5%. But also changes. So if you look at the Fed's yeah. median yeah. projection. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. throughout the last expansion, you know, we started north of probably four, got down closer to what, th- or three. So, yeah, but I, I, but you know, that, that empirical rule that the 10 years should equal nominal GDP, that's over a long period of time. There can be long periods of time where they don't hold for lots of different reasons, which we'll talk, we, I think I've talked about in previous podcasts, but I won't do that here. Okay. All right. I don't, I don't want to belabor that. Uh, I, I do want to ask this though. And this is also bothering me um, about monetary policy, the appropriate monetary policy in our forecast. Do you think there are things that are idiosyncratic to the situation that we're in that will make the relationship between monetary policy and economic growth that has historically held on average different this time around? Meaning less sensitive, the economy is going to be less sensitive to monetary policy or more sensitive to monetary and if I do that in my own, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say anything more than say, when I think about that question, I land in a place that says the economy is going to be less sensitive to economic activity. Therefore, the Fed is going to have to raise rates more aggressively than we think. Not 275, not 31, not three and a half, but something higher than that to get the economy to slow. So, so what do you think of that? Any views on that? And I, I can go through the, you know, the, my reasoning around that, but I'm just curious if you've got a view on that. Before. I mean, the one that jumps out is that, you know, the share of more like just debt outstanding that's fixed is exactly. a lot higher now. Yeah, so like, yeah exactly. So that's the you, first one that I always go to. Like, like debt service for household sector, that's the share of income that they're voting to principal interest on debt to remain current on it is pretty close to a record low. And it looks like it's gonna be very hard for that thing to rise because everyone's locked in through the refinancing waves that got into 30, 15 year mortgages. So that feels like debt service isn't gonna rise very quickly here. And that you know obviously makes it more difficult for the Fed to slow the economy. A lot of corporate debt's fixed. Is that too, I, I don't know that as well. Is that right? Is yeah, it, more than it was in past decades. Is that so, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Can we get, I haven't seen that data. Do you have that? There's data? still a lot of refinancing that has to happen just naturally, but yeah. Know, you know, businesses aren't taking out you know, these variable rates. So, yeah, if you've got, I'd love to see that data. I haven't seen that data, but uh, mm-hmm. what do you think? What do you think, Chris? Do you think the economy is more or less sensitive or is it all a wash? I'm just splitting hairs here. No, I agree with you. I was going to go with the uh, moral hazard argument that, right, because we've put all this support into the economy now through the last two cycles, that uh, kind of along the lines of the Powell put that uh, consumers, investors are going to be. That's expecting it right so the, the sensitivity then is going to be reduced uh, right they have to be even more aggressive to really send the message that uh we're on business. the case so. oh everyone thinks everyone thinks oh you're gonna you're you're, you're you gonna bail me you out can't, you can't tolerate any economic pain i am not worried things start going off the rails you're gonna cut interest rates and bail me out therefore i'm not gonna stop anything that i'm doing right i'm not gonna curtail expansion plans i'm gonna keep hiring that kind of thing. That's interesting. Yeah. What do you think of that explanation, Ryan? He's not yeah, buying it. <laughs> he's not. No, buying no, I'm bu- no. I oh, you are. Okay. I mean, it's, it's like think about it the other way around. So, with interest rates so low, when there's any sign of economic weakness or a looming recession, they're much more. Gra- they, they don't wait. They get down to zero as fast as they can, and then they restart QE. So, you know, I think on the other side, the flip side, it works the same way. Yeah, here's a couple. Here's a few other things that uh, I think make the economy feel like it's a little less sensitive to what the Fed has in mind. Uh, pent up vehicle demand. People couldn't buy cars, 
because of the pandemic, the supply chain disruptions, lack of inventory. They still want the cars. So, you know, the, and when those cars become available as supply chains iron out and there's more production, we'll see vehicle sales increase, even though historically at this point when the Fed's tightening monetary policy and, and auto lending rates are rising, it puts pre downward pressure on vehicle sales. So instead of vehicle sales falling like they typically do, they're going to rise. What do you think of that explanation or what, what, that theory? Well, don't you think affordability is going to continue to erode like as the higher rates go up? And if new vehicle prices don't fall as fast as we think, then yeah, you may want a car, but- you know, But we the know there's pent-up not... demand there. We know there's latent pent-up demand. People want yeah. to buy cars, right? Yeah, they want to buy a car. Yeah, there's a difference between willing and able to buy a car. Yeah. yeah okay. So you think, you think that they just won't be able to- purchase the kill car well i'm assuming you get supply chains ironing out more production more inventory okay. prices start coming in you know and that the price declines obviously auto loan rates are going up but the net of all that may be and also vehicle uh, gasoline prices are going to come in if everything sticks to script but we know mm -hmm. we know that people wanted to buy cars and haven't been able to buy cars and some people will need to buy cars right yes. regardless Okay. How about this? Home building. There's a shortage of homes, a, a, a standard shortage of homes. We, you know, we pegged the shortfall. We've talked about this many times, 1.5, 1.6 million uh, housing units. That's what's the shortfall in new housing construction relative to underlying demand. Uh, maybe home building doesn't, and, and generally in most cycles, you raise mortgage rates, housing gets crushed, and home building gets hammered, right? And that's the principal way that rates affects the housing markets and the economy because it's really home sales fall, but that's no big deal to economic output. It's really about home building. That's what really matters. But maybe home building does not fall or doesn't fall nearly to the same degree because you've got all this pent up kind of uh, vacancy rates are very low, rents are very high, a lot of incentives to build. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I think there's some, I think it, it relates to the auto argument. So it might smooth things out. I don't know yeah. that that trend gets reversed though, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning I don't expect, uh, you know, uh, house, home building to remain at its level, regardless of what happens to interest rates, right? But maybe it doesn't decline as much as you otherwise would expect. So, of course, we have a bet on this one, don't we? We do. We do. Wow. Right. I'm winning, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you think you're winning in your mind, you're winning. Your mind oh, I forgot revisions. Yes. Yeah, revi yeah. <laughs> Mark's going to hang uh, on to that revision. In. What are you talking about? I'm winning three months in. Jeez Louise. What was I going to say? Where, oh, three months in. That's a, a quarter of the way there. Okay. How about this one? How about excess savings? All the cash sitting in people's uh, checking accounts because of, uh, of um, you know, COVID sheltering in place, all the government support. Uh, and, you know, high income households. They're sit, sitting on a lot of cash. We know what do we estimate the total excess saving at? Right, two point six trillion over ten percent of GDP. Yeah. Right, most of that's high income households. So stock market comes down. Historically, that had an effect on spending, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm less wealthy, I'm going to spend less. There's a wealth effect, negative wealth. Maybe there's no wealth effect because okay, stock prices are down, but I still got a lot of cash sitting in the bank account. I'm going to keep on spending. What do you think? So I think I think the psychological piece is there. You do, the, yeah. yeah. But I'm with you though. I think it cushions the blow from yeah, yeah, dropping sure. the stock market. It's helped cushion the blow to the economy from higher gasoline prices. But yeah, when you're seeing market moves like this, the sentiment. This, this is all to go to say this. I'm not sure in our. I, I believe in our forecast. I'm I'm nervous about. It. I, I, don't I think know you're if you right. want to say I, that I, publicly. I, well, how, about, how, how about how about how about let me let me push back. How about okay, some fine. spent up? Right, we saw durable goods spending go through the roof during the pandemic. Yeah. How about some spent up demand on, I don't know, power washers and pelotons and every, all the other durable yeah. goods out there, right? So there's some yeah. counter effect here, right? Yeah, but we've already pulled forward a lot of the the spending. True, but overall consumer spending, all in, goods services is precisely where it should be if there had been no pandemic. It's not like there's any big pent up or spent up demand here. Generally coming into recessions, you got a lot of spent up demand. The, the, uh, the, the people have spent well beyond their means. Saving rates are low, debt loads are high, 
you know, you don't, there's no cash. You know, people have run out of cash. They've levered up. You don't see any of that. You don't see any of that. Yeah, but the distribution's all out of whack, right? What do so, you mean? Meaning that they've already done their durable goods spending, right? So going forward, they're not going to spend durable goods. Are you arguing that they're going to double up on services? Take yeah, two trips? that's what I'm arguing. They're going to go travel. They're going to go to restaurants. They're going to go to ball games. Or, yeah, but exactly. You're saying beyond the trend, right? No, no. So they're they're, actually gonna... Yes, beyond, but beyond trend. They, there's, there's, there's spent up demand for non-vehicle goods. A lot of pent-up demand for vehicles, which is very rate sensitive, and and pent-up demand for services, healthcare, uh, travel, you know, everything on on the service side that I couldn't do in pandemic. So Ryan's so, going to yeah, do two dinners tonight instead of one. right. That's what I was about to say. <laughs> well, I don't know what's going on in the no, 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 no. It's higher qual. I'm not going to Applebee's. I'm going to go to, you know wherever you go that's the higher higher end <laughs> on the beach or something i don't know but I, I don't worry i can figure out how to spend that money i can double and, and i get three even I with 15 percent inflation i get i get dessert <laughs> i didn't get before i get two cocktails not one maybe three <laughs> more likely two but i'm just saying <laughs> anyway all right so here's what i'm what i'm saying i'm just throwing out there i like i like what you're saying ryan about they take it up to that neutral rate. They take it there really fast. So by the mm -hmm. end of the year, we're there, two and a half percent. They stop. They took a take a look around, and then they figure out maybe this economy is not slowing as much as I thought it was slowing. And then they, they then they it's not two seven five. It's something measurably higher than that. And you know, obviously, you know that becomes even trickier for the economy going forward. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, I think we covered a lot of ground. Anything I missed on monetary policy you wanted to say? That you think under uh, that scenario is that recession then? I, th I think that I think that what that yeah it, it it lowers the odds of recession in the near term, right? In the next twelve maybe eighteen months, but it raises the odds of recession a little bit further down the road as you move into the mid part of the decade. Yeah, that's what it would do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So really, it's bimodal again. Either we're going to skate through this, you know, skin of the teeth, or we're going recession. Right? There's yeah. not a whole lot of in between. Or maybe the Fed. Kind of looks through everything I just said, and they just do what the markets think, and they're going to three and a quarter, three and a half, you know, steadily. Buying. That'd be a mistake. Yeah, but you know, maybe that's what they're doing. They will do. I don't know, but it's, it's obviously pretty tricky here. Okay, all right. I, I think that was a, a pretty fulsome discussion around the Fed. I think uh, at the end of the day, we decide not to change our forecast, though. Well, we'll have to. Um, okay. We got some time. I'll talk. I'll time. talk you into the pause. Oh, the pause, right? We got to get the pause. Well, it's actually, if you look at the forecast, it's not, I only go, we only go a quarter point above the two and a half. It feels like yeah. it's a quasi yeah, pause. Yeah. You know, it's not, I'm not too far off from what you're saying. But no, yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, so if you want to uh, follow uh, Ryan's memes and his uh, trash talking <laughs> slash trolling uh, in my non response, uh, mm -hmm. you can do that on Twitter. Uh, what's your, What's your handle, uh, Ryan? At real time underscore econ. Very good. And I'm at Mark Zandy. Uh, and uh, uh, Chris is on LinkedIn, uh, not on Twitter. Um, anything else I should be saying to the folks out there? Oh, oh, oh respond to that survey about about recession probabilities. Uh, that that would be good. We'll call because we have a we're going to do a special bot, uh, podcast, Evergreen podcast. We call them Evergreens on Monday around recession. So. Uh, be uh, on the watch out for that. And we'll, we'll talk about the recession probability side. So with that, we will call it a podcast. See you next week. Take care now.